Welcome, everybody, to the Fred Minnick Show's third season. This season, I'm going to shake it up a little bit and bring in some of my favorite people in the world of whiskey to co-host. Hang out and shoot the shit before we pull up the interview. He's known as the Bourbon Sherpa on social media. He's the owner of the Woodford Hotel. He loves Kentucky through and through. My boy, Eric Carrico. And welcome back to the Fred Minnick Show this week. I've got my good buddy here, Eric Carrico, who has told me recently that I've been saying his name wrong the whole time. Did I say it right that time? That is correct. So we've been friends for a while, and I'm always saying Eric Caracal, but I it's really it's hard for me to pronounce Caraco, right? So like I have to tell myself over and over again to say Caraco and not cow. So what's so, it's it's most likely your affinity for ag culture or in cow. That's right. I <laughs> that's right. I did I did write a book on uh, I did write me a book on the on the cattle world. Well, there you go. So um, no, I get uh, Caraco Carico. Caracca, uh, it's it's Caraca. all it's okay. it's it's all over the place. So, all right. um, there is a city in Portugal called Caraco, mm. and uh, I think that's originally where it came from. I don't know. That's what my family tells Are you me. Portuguese? Uh, yes, according to the genealogy thing. But I Man, think, dude, that's awesome. I love Portugal. You ever been? No, dude, it's an amazing country. Oh. So much good food there. So the people are amazing. But the wine is off the charts. It's so good. But so anyway, so today we're going to sip on uh, Sipony. This is a uh, rye whiskey with honey, lemon juice, and sparkling water. Now, this is made by someone I considered like a colleague for a long time, and she broke out and started her own brand. Uh, Amanda Victoria was a uh, was a taster with me at San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Oh, and this is my favorite RTD. So I... I want to, you know, I like I like hooking friends up and uh, giving giving some uh, looks. So here you go. Cheers. Cheers. That is so good. Isn't that good? Yeah, I love it. It's great. Yeah, I mean, you, and you're a you're a critical son of a bitch too. And so you do uh, he and, and for what it's worth, he's already drank like five or six uh, whiskeys and RTDs before he came in here. So you got to warm yourself up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really good. This is my favorite RTD. Yeah, it's not bad at all. My brother was in the RTD world. That's a tough space. It is, but if you do it right, you know, like this, this is like real, right? Yeah, I feel you can taste. You can taste the real honey. Doesn't feel fake, but yeah. At any rate, so today's guest is Graham McTavish, and I want to I want to start off first of all, like saying like why there's been a delay. Um, in, in the shows, my producer has been in the hospital for the past, uh, three or four, uh, weeks. Actually, it's going on a month and a half now. So I'm going to say, uh, Steven Stormer, I'm thinking about you. Prayers are with you and get better. But so that's why there's been a delay here is the, the production kind of, you know, had to take a, take a break and also some big news in, in my world. I just, um, Signed my or just got my first book deal, and I'll be writing my first book since 2018. I was going to say you've done a few books, but yeah, I mean it's, it's my first new book in in a long time. Yeah, so well, congratulations on that. Yeah, well, you you know a little bit about it. the book's called Finding Crow, and it's about my about my journey and and old crow. So that is a great story to be told. Um, what he did for bourbon is something that everybody needs to know about, and. I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Well, now our guest today, Graham McTavish, I think is one of those people that can have can uh, flip a switch for bourbon as well. He's a uber celebrity and plays like uh, these old English characters in like House of Dragons. Uh, he was in a show called Outlander, and uh, and he's in The Witcher, which is on Amazon Prime. It's very 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 popular show. And you were there, actually there when we did did the interview at the Speed Museum. Yeah, the Speed Museum is a wonderful space. Um, I can't think of a better place to do an interview. Uh, his team was great. Uh, everybody there at the Speed was great. I uh, highly recommend taking a trip there, even if you're just visiting or um, maybe on the bourbon trail. So you got any Graham McTavish stories? Um, wasn't he in uh, the uh, Lord of the Rings? 
I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm going to the Google. Hold on. Maybe Let's go to the Google. Ram Tavish, Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, so he was in the. He was the uh, the main dwarf in uh, in Lord of the Rings. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that movie sparked. When I was a kid, my mom used to read me that book, and it was like the 80s cartoon version of it and stuff okay. like that. And that gave me nightmares for uh, several years. I don't know what it is. The whole smog thing, um, it was just something that stuck into my mind as like, this book kind of scares me as a kid. So, Okay. Uh, so, just, you, were, you were scared as an itty-bitty child. Yeah. And, uh, and whenever I saw the movie, uh, it was totally different, but I, I could still recall those memories like yesterday. Well, uh, hopefully, you know, no one gets scared watching this interview, but uh, I did break out some of the old crow in this in this interview with Graham because he now has a bourbon and I like to bring bur people into bourbon the, the right way. So um, please, everybody, don't get scared. Don't go away. I, we're after after the interview, Eric and I are going to uh, shoot the shit a little bit more. Enjoy. Cheers. Cheers. Well, Graham, here we are. I promise you some great bourbons here. Yes. I brought them, my friend. Well, I brought them. I, I've got to confess right from the get-go, I am somewhat intimidated. I oh, am. no. No, well, no, just it's, it, it's so impressive. It's just so impressive. And I, get, I get that a lot. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then there's the whiskey. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> It, 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 it really is amazing. Um, I'm really looking forward to trying them. Um, well, like, like, I, like I was telling them. you, you know, when someone enters the bourbon world and does it right, you know, brings in good whiskey and uh, wants to add to the conversation of yeah. bourbon. Yeah. I mean, the bourbon world wants to support you. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I mean, this is, you know, I bring out I bring out the good stuff for folks, and well, uh, every one of these have you. a story. I am looking forward to hearing all of the stories uh, because I love, you know, one of my interests in bourbon generally um, is its history and mm. what, how it came to be. Yeah. And so the individual stories of these, I'm sure, will be fascinating. So let's start with some McTavish Bottled and Bond. The War Chief. Yes. Um, let's do that. It's, uh, now, will every one of them be named after one of your characters? No. So it's always going to be the war chief. Well, no. Some of them, I'm still playing around with ideas for okay. uh, for, for for different names, uh, which I, I have I have some. Um, I uh, I never ne never quite know how much to pour because my father was a big pourer. Mm -hmm. uh, he would he would really like um, pour a lot of whiskey. This is a solid pour. It's a good ounce and a half, maybe. Ounce and three quarters. I, I, I guess it is, yeah. Yeah, solid. Mm. So this is the the Glen Cairn. This is my favorite uh, favorite whiskey glass. It's from Scotland. It is indeed. It is indeed. It's a beautiful. You get that wonderful nose in it, and the the way it opens up. So Flames. we were we were chatting a little bit about kind of how I came into being in this world. Yeah, and I was telling you about taste mindfulness. Yes. Um, the the world of tasting whiskey has always been, is usually dictated by the distillers trying to sell something. Right. And and then you have the wine world, which is filled with all these incredible palettes of sommeliers and and blenders and winemakers. Yeah. And in the in the whiskey world, there's, there's a lot of little different techniques that people use. Mm. I came from, I was a soldier. I came home from Iraq in 2005 and I was, I was like a lot of soldiers. I had a really, really difficult time readjusting, and I was, mm. I had PTSD very badly. And right. I was, I was at a moment where, I was either going to jump off a bridge, end up mm. in prison, or mm. homeless. Right. And I got in therapy, mm -hmm. and it saved my life. Right. But there becomes a time after you're like you've crossed that other side where you can survive in a moment mm. to living again. Mm. And my therapist taught me a technique called taste mindfulness. Right. And it started with, it started with a barbecue potato chip. 
and she gave me this potato chip. I put it on my tongue. She said, close your eyes, chew it, think about it. I thought this was insane. I was like, what am I signed up for here? You know, what's yeah, this, yeah, yeah, what's yeah, this yeah, therapist yeah. trying to teach me? Right. And it, Graham, it completely changed my life. I could, I focused on how the salt separated from the sugars, how the crunch felt differently on different parts of my tongue. And I started mm-hmm. applying that technique on everything that I did right. from a tasting perspective. And I was reprogramming my brain to not be anxious about my settings, about a sniper or a piece of trash being a bomb or something. Mm. And it completely reprogrammed mm. like how I taste. So what I'm gonna teach you here yes, is I, I want you to focus on your tongue as you're tasting. So just put a little bit on your tongue and see how it feels on the tip of the tongue, middle, middle toward the back, and the back, back, and the sides. So what we're doing here is yeah. we're mapping your tongue, we're mapping your palate, right. we're seeing how it hits and see where you might get your flavors. Okay. Here we go. All right. So before you think about what the flavors are, mm. tell me, where do you feel it on your tongue? Mainly middle to back. Middle to the back? Yeah, that's okay. where I that's where I feel it the most. Probably further back, yeah. Yeah. So that when you taste, when you when we taste again, I want you to focus on that part of the tongue. Mm. And everyone's tongue is different, just like everyone's yeah. athletically different, right? Right. Yes. So I will taste things differently than you. Right. Where I got a lot of the tip of tongue, sides, and um back of the palate. Mm. So normally I get sweetness on the tip, I get savory on the middle, I get spice on the back, and I get yep. bitterness like tobacco uh, oh, on, on the sides. So, so and, and so everybody's appreciation of whiskey is unique to it their is. tongue. Absolutely. Wow. That's why like, you know, like when you all in Men, uh, men in Kilts, you all went to Lafroy, right? Mm. That distillery is one of the most hated distilleries and most loved distilleries. Mm. There's some people when they taste Laphroaig, they taste Band-Aids. That, that deep level of peat, they're like, I hate that flavor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, but we're, so we're all different with what we taste when yep. it comes to this. Yep, yep. So here we go, okay. put it on the palate, focus, yep. and see what you taste. It's, it's, it's not immediately easy to, I mean, you know, my um, experience and understanding of bourbon is, is in its infancy compared mm-hmm. with yours and most of the people I've met so far on this journey. But, and so you, that, that thing that you're talking about, that mindfulness of really focusing your, your brain onto that little part of your body, never mm-hmm. mind just on your tongue, it's very... Um, Hmm. It's. I'm still getting it mainly. I would say on the middle to the back. That's where I'm. I, I guess, and that's where I'm enjoying it the most. Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm enjoying. So it. I'm going to start throwing out some some flavors. I want you mm. to think about that that area of the mm. tongue mm. and tell me if one of them hits. Cinnamon. Yes. Nutmeg. Yes, I hadn't thought of that, but. Yes, okay. you're right. Clove. Not sure about that one. Pepper. Yes. Honey. No. Chocolate. Yes. Walnuts. So Walnuts. Yeah. Wow, you're good, aren't you? You're good. <laughs> you're like, this is... I feel like I'm in the presence of some sort of Zen master. That's just a, because I'm, I'm, and I'm not. I'm not responding to auto suggestion here. No. You're actually identifying things that once you've said them, I go, I, I, I recognize what I've been searching to describe. Mm-hmm. Yes. And now the, this this important step of mindfulness is also tracing back to your roots, to to being a child sometimes. Mm. 
growing up and the flavors that you've mm. had growing up, when you are able to connect into a memory, mm. when you're able to like say, you know what, that's that's the pie my grandma made, or that's the that's the stew, uh, the smell of the stew yeah. that my my dad used to make. Yeah. That is yeah. where this all comes in. So those were very basic notes, but for you, like taste again, look a little deeper, focus on the cinnamon, the nutmeg, and that little bit of clove that you think you might have gotten. Mm. All right, mm -hmm. focus on those three things and see if something you know from your past hits. Mm. I got to do this with you while your palate's fresh because by, after five of these, it's blown it, it to won't, pieces. It won't work as right. well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. G giving me that that thought of connecting it to a memory. Very, very powerful. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding it, it does remind me of being in the kitchen with my mother when she would always, um, when she would do a cake, you mm -hmm. know, like when she would prepare a cake, specifically probably for Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the smell, from, not, the, not, the, not the baked cake, but the, the mix that she would be making in the bowl and that, and I can, you know, I can hear the sound of her of her doing it when I'm when I'm tasting that. Wow! And it's very, and and I would stand, and and the, you know, those smells, those those notes, the cinnamon and the nutmeg. Yeah, it's that. It's a colder time of the year. Um, I'm uh, I'm in the kitchen. There she is. I'm looking in the bowl. She, I, I become fascinated by the process of what she's doing, and then she she lets me help. But the smells and the anticipation that those smells create um, really is very strong. And that, yeah, wow, this is this is like um, it is like therapy almost, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Until you had like twelve of them, and then it's well, like, and then it becomes different. something else. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very different. <laughs> but it, it is very, very, very interesting. I've never ever approached tasting anything in this way. It's very well, good. Cheers, my friend. Yeah. Cheers. I'll drink to that. Absolutely. Mm. And the last part is how long is it still on your tongue? How long can you still fill it there? That's the finish. And by the way, for your first release, this is damn good. Thank you, friend. Yeah. I, this, that means a lot. That this really is, this does. This is really good. That really means a lot, mate. Um, do you know how many bottles you'll have on your first run? Ooh, well, that's a question for 3,000. 3,000? Okay. About, about 3,000, yeah. Um, it's respectable. Yeah, and it's um, your question. Yeah, I can still feel it. And it's, it's sort of sliding around the edges now. Okay. Onto the sides. And uh, yeah, and the the back of my throat got a sort of long enough, long enough. And, and what's interesting as well, of course, is that the longer you leave it, changes just to happen. And, and yes, it, absolutely. You, you, so <sighs> you, it, when you, and when you would, when you go to taste it again tomorrow or two weeks from now, it could be different. And the whiskey's not changing. You are changing. Yeah. Right. Every single day, everything that you do will have an impact on your palate. Mm. So, like, if you had an onion before coming in here, or if you ate that mint, it'd have a big impact Which on I did your palate. Not, but not. Yes. I was very proud of you. Yeah. Or if you got in a fight with with so, spouse or something, it could have a huge impact. Really? So, so even your your emotional levels, your absolutely, you know, cortisol, all of that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Can we, okay. Well, and we're we're all different. My, you know, if I am. I wouldn't say I'm a people pleaser, but like if I know that I've got mm. a riff with someone in my in my mm. circle, mm. I can't do anything. You know, like it it can it it impairs me from from tasting oh, well. Really? So and or if I'm in uh, if I have a bad if I have an anniversary date, like to to a moment that was you know where I lost a loved one or something Difficult, bad happened right. to me in Iraq oh. or something, like 
my palate's really off, so my body will know. So it's it's very, you know, when when you really start to connect with your palate and, and focus on it and use that and as a tool, you'll notice these things kind of change. What about energy levels as well? If you you know if you were feeling a little more tired or if you were feeling more rested, if you if, if yeah. you have a more stressful day, a relaxing day, all of those sort of things, exercise. What, what is interesting is I have found that when I'm tired, my palate is really good, really good. Right. But if I have, if I have um, exerted myself a lot athletically, then my palate will be off. And I, I'm, I'm in jujitsu, and so like if I get strangled really badly during, during a session, my, I, my tasting's <laughs> note, all off. Note to self, don't <laughs> let yourself get strangled too badly before you drink whiskey. It, it, That's words it, to live by, Fred. It, it, I mean, uh, yeah. It's bad for the throat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's just not good. Yeah. I am definitely not going to strangle anyone before any more tastings. Yeah. Well, but then some of your characters might, though, you know. Most of them. Most fact, all, pretty much all. Pretty of much them. all of them. Yeah, they're big into strangling. Yeah. They love the strang or the knifing. The knifing. Or, yeah. You know. Yeah, the beheading. The yeah. It's all very <laughs> unfortunate, but hey. <laughs> you de you definitely have um, you have cornered the market on like the war chief. Guy, right. the, the the number two, yeah. the, the lead uh, commander. You yeah. have you have cornered the market on this very particular role mm. that we all love. Mm. But every single character <laughs> is so different. Like, oh, like well, good. You, you, it could be the same. Like, but you are so different in every one of them. Like, how Thank do you, you. How, I'm I'm actually fascinated with how you're able to change when the roles could be perceived as very similar. Mm. That's a very good question. I think um, my approach, uh, I, I, I don't do, you know, I'm not method as such. I'm not, I'm not sort of doing enormous amounts of prep. Uh, I do research, especially if they're historical. Um, and even if they're not strictly historical, like, for instance, something like House of the Dragon, uh, I would research people like Sir Harold Westerling. So somebody mm -hmm. who is the commander of a, of a bodyguard, you know, how they work, how they operate, how they stand and and their thought processes. You know, that's that's really how I approach it. And that informs so much of how you portray a character is is simple things like how do you stand? Um, how do they walk? Uh, what's their vocal level like? Do they raise their voice? Are they are they more relaxed? And those sort of things can can, can affect things. But mainly it's always about being truthful. That's that's all it is. And it sounds really simple, and in some ways it is, but it is simply telling the truth of that character. So you don't try and bend them mm -hmm. to what you want them to be. You you allow them to speak through you, through the writing and the directing and, and just fleshing out the character in that way. And and because they're all different, hopefully each portrayal is different as well. What character felt in most like you. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, I mean, I would I would qualify that by saying that inevitably there is a part of me in every character that sure. I've played. Definitely. Uh, some parts of me that I would prefer to conceal, perhaps. You know, <laughs> that, or or at least you know they they reflect thoughts that I may have. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for instance, someone like Dwalin in The Hobbit, I based very much on my father. Uh, I mean, not literally, but the dourness, the, the sort of slightly black and white view of the world, that was my father. And so I, I based a lot of that on him. Um, but someone like uh, Dougal Mackenzie in, in Outlander, who's also Scottish, he's, um, he's, he's much more... Um, Passionate and uh, that uh, was, he's yeah. yeah he's he's he doesn't do a lot of thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. He acts yeah. impulsively, and and in order to do that in a scene, you have to be prepared to just try anything and see what works, and 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 have the other actor trust you enough to be able to go with right. with that. And uh, and so I try and harness those sort of things. I try and not. And that's why I don't do too much prep, because I don't want to be tied in that way. I want to be more spontaneous, because I think through spontaneity, you, you portray truth. 
Well, you made that series, and when when Dougal McKenzie was killed, spoilers, I suppose. Murdered, I think, is the word murdered, you're looking for. Mur yeah. Murdered is the right Brutally word. Brutally murdered, yes. I mean, a lot of us thought that was going to be the end of the series. That was like, that was to see that character go. Mm. That was heartbreaking for, for all of us, especially in, in the scenario, because like you're watching this as a fan, mm. and they're, you, you see them trying to create a, a strategy to, to uh, in not, Culloden not to yeah. have yeah. happen, right? Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're trying to do this. Yeah. And you're like, this is stupid. Yes. Why, why would you do this? And you kind of walk in on it, and it just like, and for them to murder you. I was like, that was tough, but was that was that difficult for you to let go of that character? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I knew it was coming. I knew from when I when I got the the role that that was what happened to him. But uh, it was it was because I'd I'd really grown to love the people that I was working with, love the character, love the world of, of mm -hmm. Outlander, you know, the Highlands, etc. And uh, so it was it, it was tricky, and it was a very emotional scene. It was my Second to last scene, actually. Um, my last scene was the death of my brother. Right. Oh, so you filmed that? You that, filmed that, that separately? Yeah, that was my very last scene. Okay. And it was also Gary's last scene. And that was very emotional, too, for different reasons. Uh, but, but with the scene with, with Sam and Katrina, um, in, in, in when I discover their plot, uh, it was very hard because he, he's, his heart is broken. Yeah. Dougal's. Heart, just heartbroken, and he uh, he sees such an enormous betrayal at the hands of his nephew um, that he would rather, in, in a way, he would rather die than have to live with that knowledge. But you know, obviously, he he, he wants to. I mean, I think I say to him at one point, um, "Let me kill you quick for the sake of your mother." Um, but I have to kill him because yeah. of you know he, he is yeah beyond the pale. But uh, yeah, it was it was a very very difficult scene, um, but very enjoyable and a very enjoyable experience. He's one of the most interesting, complicated characters I've ever played, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I I love that series. I love how they shot it. I mm. love how they oh, yeah. incorporated history of Scotland that yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, I didn't know anything about the Jacobites. I know. You know? And then know. we learn about that, and that's yeah. that's become obsessed. But. Yeah. I, I could ask you questions all day long about your career, and we will, but I want to get to the next yes. bourbon. We, we got to rinse our palates out. Okay, okay. So this do. is very important. Yes, of course. Yeah. And now I'm going to take you to a historical journey, an American whiskey, mm. a brand that almost wasn't, and we're actually going to kill this bottle together. Wow, that this sounds is, so um, dramatic. <laughs> this is A.H. Hearst. Okay. Um, distilled in color. 1974. Wow. 16 years old, bottled in the 1990s. I can feel people off camera actually weeping. I can hear them, they're weeping. My friend Chuck Cowdery thinks that this is the greatest bourbon ever made. Really? This was distilled in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. at a distillery called Michter's, which that bottle right there, but the okay. company was going out of business, so someone came and acquired the barrels, mm. brought them down to Kentucky, and uh, bottled them. Some of them were tanked, and you can you can take the barrels of something, and you can put them in stainless steel tanks, and the, the aging stops. And when you're ready to bottle it, you you can bottle it. But when it's in the barrel, the the ticker keeps going. So there's actually a bottle that's twenty. There's a twenty year old that they did wow. uh, of the same whiskey, but this is the widely considered to be in the list of the greatest bourbons ever made. It is also in my top 10, and we have my number one on this table. I'll tell you about that wow. in a minute. But exciting. So, so Graham, look at that color. I know, I mean, you very know, different. So, so different. Yeah. You know, to be bourbon, it must go into a new charred oak barrel, and every single day it's in that wood, it's going mm. in and out, right? Mm. And yours is seven, this is 16 years. So mm -hmm. look at all that color difference yeah. right there. Yeah, wow. That That's is something, very right? cool. All right. Remember your training. I don't think I. We didn't go over the nosing process, but no. I could tell you were already pretty familiar. But one thing, when you smell, you want to smell with your mouth slightly open. Okay. You're relaxing your olfactory there. Should be able to pick up a little bit more, and then you want to go side by side in your nostrils. What you do when you do that, 
you actually you pick up different really notes on different each side. Nostrils. Really? Yeah. God. Wow. And open up the open up the nose too. So here we go. Put it yep. on the palate. Focus on what part of the tongue you feel it. Cheers. Cheers. This is a privilege moment. Mm. Oh my god. Mm. Yeah. That's pretty special. That's that immediately you feel the specialness of that whiskey. Yeah. I mean, even before you let it settle on your tongue, it's it's yeah. already speaking to you in a in a in a very, very particular, unique way. It's oh. Oh my god. It's been a while since I've had this. Been holding on this bottle to kill it with the right person. So. Oh, I've, I'm, I'm really honored. That is, and, and we finished the bottle. We did. Oh my God. And your friends over there, as you see their drool falling down, yeah. they're and not gonna, gonna get any. Cry, <laughs> cry. It is. So what part, do you feel it all over the tongue or is there a particular spot? I, I, actually, funny you should say that because I do. I do feel it. It, it, it really just sort of, took over my tongue. It yeah. was just, it was, it was saying to my tongue, I want all of you little taste buds to welcome this. This is, this is, this is special. Wow. Um, we call, I call this all mouth coating where <laughs> right. it's like all over the tongue, curls up underneath the tongue, you know, down the jaw lines. You can feel it on the roof of your How mouth. It it's like, you know, there, this is obviously chemistry in a bottle. Right? Yeah, right. right but yeah. but there's there's thing there are components in this um, that if you were to put it under a particular mm. um, scientific device, it would pull out all that it has, and it would you would find like you know certain fatty acids in there. Mm. You'd see a, a low level of higher alcohols, which give it kind of burning notes. You'd see mm -hmm. things like lipids in there, and then you get deeper into it. You could see like vanillin properties from the wood. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's like a perfect marriage. It's almost like that perfect brisket. You know, if you cook a brisket too fast, you, mm -hmm. you taste too much smoke. Um, if you mm -hmm. if you if you cook it too long, it, it won't be it'll tear apart too easily. Mm -hmm. And the flavor is just kind of like the this juice is gone. Mm -hmm. But if you cook it just right, you get the perfect amount of juices, you get the right mm -hmm. texture of the meat, and then you get that perfect smoke. So bourbon is is a lot more art than it is yeah. science, right. in my opinion. And you, I'm still feeling that, by the way. It's still there. It's still yeah. really, it's just resting there, allowing me to just really savor it over a long period. Wow. These are special. It's... um. There's a sort of cream to it, which is, you know, that, that sort of um, layer on the top of a, of, a, of a really, you know, an old fashioned sort of, this is gonna sound weird, but the kind of milk that I used to drink when I was a child, which was basically like raw milk. Yeah. So not processed really. This has that. No 2% back then. No, none of that, none yeah. of that. And it was just that, that lovely creamy top layer, I can mm. feel that. It's not that it tastes of milk, but it's right, got that, that, that feeling, that yeah. texture, you know. It's a beautiful texture. It really is. So this is what we would say in a word, it's complicated, it's complex. There's a lot of flavors here and it's hard to break this one down in any, in any way. Um, but if you had to pick one flavor that you get out of this, can you do that? Okay, and, and, and this is, I'm always hesitant to say the things that come into my mind for There's fear. There's no wrong of, answers here, Graham. Okay. No wrong answers. Well, um, I'm gonna say bubble gum. There's a kind of, you know, that, that again, it feels like I'm just constantly going back to my childhood, but, but that flavor of a, it's got that sort of candy, sweetness to it that's really yeah. really really um pleasing it's just and, and it you know it, it activates that part of your brain that's going oh yeah i remember this this is, this is nice 
Yeah, that's that's a good note. Like especially the old school bubble gums. Like today, exactly very different. Exactly. Yeah, the old school ones that uh, I grew up with. I'm trying to remember the names. What was it? Hubba 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 Bubba. Yeah, Hubba Bubba. Yeah, that's right. Hubba Bubba. It, there was like a layer of sugar right around it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a little yeah. hard, but once you got it in the mouth, it was kind yeah, of yeah. Mushy. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gosh, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, kids today. Kids today, they don't kids, understand. They don't understand bubble gum. I know. They had the real stuff. <laughs> mm. Oh, man, that's still on my palate. Sorry, I'm just enjoying drinking this far too much. This is... That's okay. Just save yourself for a few. We've got we got, we got a little bit of ways to go. I just here. don't want to waste it, though. Oh, you're not. You won't waste it. I'm, and your friends will definitely. Oh, actually, that's true. I you, should... You do have friends. You, you don't have to save it for them, but... Well, I would feel... Really gesticulating wildly now. Uh, I, I will save a, l a little bit of that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, we haven't even got to the best one yet. In oh my, opinion. my God! So now I want to take you to the distillery uh, from whence that from that bottle actually came, or actually okay. rather the brand. This is uh, Michter's. This is their ten-year-old rye from this year. Now Michter's was mm. a distillery in Pennsylvania that. Wow. Closed in 1987 when someone came and bought those particular barrels that we just tasted. Oh. And after that, a company called Chatham Imports mm -hmm. acquired the, the rights to the brand. And they started making um, whiskey for this traditional Pennsylvania brand with Kentucky whiskey. Mm. And this was one of the most controversial things that a distiller at this time could do or a brand could do. Because Pennsylvania... In Kentucky, were rivals. This is like Scotland and England. Oh, they really? were I didn't huge know rivals on the oh. American whiskey scene. Right. And Michter's was was like the last standing major player in Pennsylvania. Right. And when they folded, that entire state felt it. Which Pennsylvania's laws are very difficult to run a company like for, really? for a whiskey company. It's very right? difficult there. Hmm. And this this brand, um, you know, carries the heritage from Pennsylvania. But it's also kind of forged like a new, you know, they, they have two distilleries now in Kentucky. They mm -hmm. have warehouses all over the state. Mm -hmm. So they've like forged a new, like a new path for the brand. But at the time, this was this was a big deal when they made that move. And they had a lot of a lot of hate toward it. Now, mm -hmm. this is one of the most coveted brands on the market. Really? So it's one of the it's, it's like a really incredible case study of business of like doing something that is not popular, but making it where it's the talk of the town. Right. Wow. This is and this is a rye. So this is. Oh yeah. You know, we've been sipping bourbon. Yeah. Uh, which is predominantly corn. Rye, of course, is predominantly the rye grain, mm. which is not widely planted in the United States. Uh, it's more used as a cover crop, oh. but it it's uh, widely planted in Canada, Finland, and the Dakotas here in the states. Okay. Yeah. Very. Uh Immediately very different. All right. Oh. I already started drinking it. No, no. I, I, I skipped ahead of you there, sorry. Mm -mm. That's pretty tasty. Definitely feel that spice more though, don't I? Yeah. I know. It's, it's and that is, and I'm glad you said that because rye is known for bringing that spice where bourbon's a little bit more on the sweeter side. Mm. And it's important to note too that rye, you know, any the spice versus alcohol burn, which new drinkers always come across like, oh my God, that's really, really alcohol forward. Mm. Alcohol burn feels like a nine volt battery on your tongue, mm. whereas alcohol spice is more like like how Tabasco feels, you know, some kind of like hot sauce. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. very different. Right, right. I understand. And it's got a kind of one of the things that it made me think of on the nose, particularly, but also on the taste, is um, is a sort of a an icy lake. I don't know why. Oh. Yeah. Just Which uh, you would have a lot of experience with. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Just that that sort of winter chill mm. that's that's um I don't know why it just popped into my head when I was especially when I was smelling it there. Very um mm, hmm. evocative. And that's a wonderful thing, which I'm learning at your very capable hands, is the um is as you understand this more, you're, like anything, your appreciation of it yeah. really increases. You, you, you go from, you know, my very first experience of bourbon, which was at the hands of my friend who was sitting off camera, Nolan North, um, where I, m my only reaction was, I've never had bourbon. This is really good. This is, this is, this is not what I expected at all. Yeah. Um, to, to this, which you start to really discern the differences between them. Oh. Hmm. Going okay. down the uh, journey of, of American that, whiskey yeah. is um, is fun, but it's also expensive. <laughs> yes, I can only imagine. I don't. I, I don't think I want to know how much <laughs> this has cost you. It 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 is. Yes, it is expensive, but it's like if you start down that road of collecting things, you know, I, I started collecting uh, first editions of, of um, children's books, actually. It was really as when my children were very young, mm. and I started buying books that I knew as a child as first editions. And I can, I can start to get a little pricey. Yeah, you get pricey. Yeah. But it also becomes a so you could just become like a first edition uh, critic of children's books to, to help you with 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 that. I mean, <laughs> yes. it, yeah. and then it's a then it's a um, you know then it's a job. It's a yeah. tax write off. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's it's yeah, you're doing the world a favor, really, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. That is that is. Certain. I'm going to hold back because I am feeling the eyes burning into my head. Yeah. Um, well, we'll share with them. Um, as well on some other things. Now this one, oh. this is from the 1930s and 1940s. What? I want to tell you, like after Prohibition, which have you ever had a Prohibition era role? I see you being a very good Scottish bootlegger. Into the I would States. love to do that. That's yeah. a really good idea, Fred. Yeah, I think, um, that, I think you'd be good for that. I, I would love to do that. I've never, no, I never have. And it's such a fascinating period to me in, uh, in American history. Yeah. So after Prohibition, there was not a lot of um, straight whiskey, like like uh, the McTavish that you have there, which mm -hmm. is bottled in a bond, seven years old, because most of the whiskey had been used for medicinal purposes right. and prescribed by doctors. By the way, Prohibition was a hell of a time to get sick. You could get, <laughs> you could get cocaine, morphine, heroin, whiskey. I mean, whatever you needed, the doctors would prescribe it. Um, wow. And... They didn't have a lot of that, so they would they would blend a, what they had together, and they called it a blend of straights. Now, the term would end up taking a, kind of like a backseat in the next like 30, 40 years, but it's beginning to return in American whiskey, and this is one of the more, this is this is Four Roses, which today we know it for for like a, the incredible bourbon brand, mm. but this is how they they sold their whiskey uh, back in the day. Mm. And this is this is one of the old school bottles. So this would be from the 1930s and 40s? Yeah, so this would have been bottled in the 1940s. Good grief. During the war. Wow. Wow. And what's interesting, during World War II, um, there was the distilleries actually made industrial alcohol for the war effort. And where you went in Lafroy, that was an ammunitions and barracks base for, for really? the, uh, for the Allied forces. That. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This tastes smelling great. Mmm. Mmm. All so different. Yeah. Oh. You pardon the pun. The the taste is on the tip of my tongue and I can't quite put my finger on it. Um I'll go through. I'll go through a few. Okay. Do you taste marzipan? 
Yep, I do. Do you taste um, vanilla? Yes. Cinnamon? Maybe, yeah, maybe a bit. Caramel? Mm, not so much. Brown sugar? Yeah. Oatmeal? Oh. Uh, yeah, actually, quite strongly. Interesting. That's, I think, the one that I had on the tip of my tongue that I couldn't put my finger on. Oatmeal. Oatmeal is not something that you would see a lot in um, an American whiskey. Um, this is a, more of an Irish whiskey note that yeah. I'd often get. But this, this goes down a trajectory of, um, of, of flavors that are extinct in American whiskey. Like this is, this, this thing is, this is one of the more unique flavor profiles that are out there. But Very much so. But here's the thing about these old bottles. Like I had to replace the cork. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. And I had to, if you take a look, that's a, that's a modern cork. Yeah, 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 right, okay, yeah. But these, these old bottles, the cork will break off in there. Ah. And so, um, like I, I opened this up two years ago. Oh, did you? And, and, and I've maintained it in a very cool, dark place. And, um, but I, I was afraid that I was gonna lose it. And then I, I sipped just a little bit up to make sure, but I was very, very excited to, to break this out with you. Yeah. A little piece of history. It is, and I love that about it. I mean, obviously, well, history affects the taste because of when it was bottled, but I, I love the, um, the passage of time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the lives that have touched that. In, uh, it's, it's really, this is a very dangerous conversation, actually, too, because <laughs> I can see myself becoming like, hmm, yes, maybe I'll start collecting rare bourbons. Uh, uh, well, well, that's the worst things you could do. Uh, you know what? Collecting rare bourbons just means you're going to open it up with your friends. That, that's the thing about collecting. Like yeah, real, yeah. real collectors in the space mm. bust it out with their friends. Like I always share. And when, when a collector doesn't share, well, that's what we call a grade A dickhead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> a selfish bastard. Yes. A selfish bastard. <laughs> yeah. That is. And I'm, I'm trying to keep. A, 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 so, yeah. I'm trying to keep an order. Up. I'm lining them up with the. Okay. The bottles. So that's the four right. roses. Very good. Okay. So this is this is for my friends. So All right. they will know what is what. Well, the next one, I'm gonna save this one for last because it's so high proof and it could potentially kill your palate. And I want you I, I want but it's important for you to see the diversity of American whiskey. But mm. I want to tell you about what we're are about to set up here. This uh, this is an old crow chess piece. This came out in 1969. Wow. Almost this was um, this was owned by a company called National Distillers that was trying to capitalize um, on the chess movement of the late 1960s, mm -hmm. early 1970s, because we, we had the, the Bobby Fischer, the chess protege. Mm -hmm at the time and it was kind of he was like he had America captured like he was very focused on it mm. so we were all very focused on Bobby Fischer and like what he meant to America at that time which was very odd if you mm. go back and look at it but we were yeah. looking it was it was at the the height of the Vietnam War we were I guess we were just looking for victories that's right yes and old crow was trying to capitalize on this this was the beginning of the demise of bourbon so oh. when vodka becomes popular in the 1960s bourbon goes um, downward. Yeah, yeah. And the only thing that was really doing well were these decanters. Michter's had like a uh, King Tut decanter series. Mm. Jim Beam had uh, decanter partnerships. <laughs> and Old Crow came out with this chess, this chess set. I first tasted this 10 years ago, and I immediately thought it was the best bourbon I had ever tasted. And then I tasted it again, and I confirmed it. Then I tasted a couple others, and it was like, the bottles didn't always keep. You can see here that this cork yeah. didn't last. Feel yeah. that, feel how dry that is. Oh yeah. They did not, they did not build this decanter to, to last. To last. No. Like at least the cork's like this was meant for chess collectors. 
And because that it was targeted to chess people, there was, there was a lot of these to uh, acquire. Like mm. I was buying these all up for, for a long time and I made the very big mistake of doing an interview with BBC Radio, they asked me like, what's the greatest bourbon you ever tasted? Oh no. And I said, oh yeah, the, the old, and I don't know what it was, because I'd always kept that very close to my chest. Like, yeah, right, yeah. But I told BBC Radio, yeah, ends up yeah. on Reddit and a few other places, I went from being able to buy this right here for like 40 bucks to $700 in a matter of like a couple of days. And I'm very fortunate that, you know, enough people know that this is my favorite bourbon of all time that friends will, if they see it, they, you know, they'll, they'll get it and they'll weigh it because um, there's a particular weight to it that you know it's full. Oh. And, because you can't always tell. So you have to weigh it to make sure it's full of whiskey and hasn't evaporated. And uh, a good friend, Brett Atlas, uh, got this for me after we did a charity together. But it's wow. been decanted and ready for you, my friend. And, and so, well, thank you. And, and so there are, the di there are different chess pieces. So yes, they, the have every, and, they have every uh, they have every single and, uh, both sides. Very cool, very cool. And this, Look my friend, I that. I do believe that you should you should sip this all to yourself. I wouldn't share this one. <laughs> but we'll we'll I'm give a we'll give a we'll give a nip to them after. I'm literally getting abuse but, now. From but cheers, cheers to your good health. Look at that color. I I know it's ten years old. I'm actually writing a book on this brand right really? now. Really? And what happened to it and, and how it's connected to me and my own personal journey. Really, really, wow. Very excited about it. Now to taste it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. The silent contemplation of greatness. Yeah. That is amazing. I'm just going to have another tip now. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. That is pretty good, Fred. Thank you. That really. Got a really sort of. It's interesting as well, is. It's got a delicious sort of lightness of touch to it as well on the tongue it's very not it it's, doesn't that's a beautiful i i can't describe to you how beautiful that is and it gives me hope about your palate oh like how good it is oh this is the you. lightest and proof of everything we have tasted ah uh, right so that flavor that you feel the tickling of the tongue Mm. The the lips maybe there you feel it a little bit there like i do mm. but it yeah. that is that's from how the whiskey was made, the yeast, the water, the grains, the barrels they use, where they put it in the warehouse. Yeah. We are tasting extinct whiskey, history yep. in a bottle. Yep. Um, and I, I, tasting it here with you, I, I once again, it's, it's the greatest thing uh, I've ever tasted. That's, greatest bourbon I've yeah, ever tasted. Yeah, that is, wow. It really is pretty incredible. Mm. really unique of, of what we have tasted completely unique just I can't think of a flavor in there that is the same as as any of the others it, it's just um And a word complex. Yeah, yeah, very complex. I'm literally rendered speechless. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to 
I'm, I'm trying to compose myself when tasting this because it's like... Yeah, no, I can understand. I'm, I'm fanboying over it again. Of I mean, I, I don't break this out and just taste it all the time. Like, there's, no, there's not many no. of these left in the world. And it's like, yeah. this is... It's, it's, a, it's a connection to our heritage. It's, it, this, is, this was bourbon giving its best shot forward um, when vodka was coming to take over the whole spirits industry. This, this was it. This was bourbon's very best at our worst time. And I think that's why this bottle always speaks so much to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just picturing, you know, flared jeans and tight print shirts yeah. sitting around a sort of sunken living room on, on shag sofas. Shag carpet. Yeah, shag carpets, Maybe lava a, lamps. A, a minivan. Or yeah. It wasn't a minivan. It was like the Volkswagen van. Yeah. 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 Just that whole vibe, you know, really quite awful male haircuts, uh, <laughs> of which I, I was, I sported a couple of those. Love it. Um, yeah, I really picture it completely, and, and there it is on the table, you know, sharing it with people. Um, and and that, you're exactly right. It, it, it brings alive in its tasting a moment in history that you can completely yeah. visualize. It's really extraordinary. Special, special pour. About killed it. It, it feels, it feels almost wrong, but so right. It yes. does feel right. And I, this is, yeah. And unfortunately I've given you, I've given you a taste that you're always going to be chasing now with your own bourbon brand. Like I've opened some, well, opened your palate. No, but up. I feel like that, that's good. You know, I, yeah. I want to, you know, this is what you aspire to. You aspire to moments like this with, with something that you produce yourself where you sit in just stunned contemplation of, of, of what has been created here. The, I, I wonder what it was like for the people who made this originally to sit and taste it for the first time. And I'll bet you they, anything they hated it going into I bet uh, this they decanter. Did. I bet they did. Because I can imagine how hard it would have been to put it in there. And I they're bet, like, oh, you're right. They would have sat there <laughs> And the, the news would have been broken to them by somebody in sales. And they would have just gone, what? And they would have had to have just sat there and gone, great. I think that'll be really great. And then they would have left the room, probably gone to a quiet place, just sobbed uncontrollably. Yeah. Uh, you know, oh. went home that night. Their wives, what is it, honey? I can't talk about it. <laughs> I can't talk about it. But that's what would have happened for sure. Oh, that's hilarious. You, you captured that perfectly. Bob. Fred, that was, that was really amazing. I, um, I mean, there's, there are superlatives that you run out of when you describe something like that. Cheers. You got a little drop there. Cheers. Yeah. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. Beautiful. Right, well, I'm going to just put the empty glass to one yeah, side. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll share. We'll give your friends a, a little taste. Yeah, we'll be there. One of the things, um, as, I, I, as an Outlander fan, one of the things that I've noticed that is different in that series than, than the other series you're in, mm. and it, it might actually be, and, and all the other characters do it, mm. there is a, there is like a, uh, kind of like this facial, facial moment where people go, <clears throat> or something like that. And every every one of the characters do it when right. they're trying to make a point or something. And yeah. I wondered, like, are you all? Do you all get directed on your uh, in Outlander? Do you get directed on your on your facial? No, no, no. There's no direction of that. There's very, I mean, no. Uh, as an actor, I would I would find that really quite annoying actually, if somebody started doing that to me. Uh, but no, I mean, those things come somewhat naturally. I, I, again, it's, it's, it's marrying your performance to the truth of where that character is from and, and who, who they are. Yeah. So if, it, if, if, you're, if you're sufficiently um, with the character, then those expressions, they do come naturally. They're not forced. And not even planned, not 
thought of. They just they just come, and uh, I'm trying someone to think. Someone someone had to start that because it's like it's like it's everyone a thing, has like really. Is it? It, it's I, in. It's you know, in, I've never noticed that before, but that's so interesting. I'm trying to think what mine would be. Hmm. Yeah. So when you all are about to play that sport, shinty. Shinty. One of the most violent sports ever yes. invented. Yeah. It looks wonderful, by the way. Oh, it's great fun. Yeah. yeah. As a former rugby player, I'm like, oh, I want to get in that. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, but there, there, you you did that in that moment, and there was a couple other moments where you all did it. But it, it continues mm. after your character goes, and mm. and I was just like, it's something that you you pick up on when you watch the series. You see some, you, you see like facial, um, you know, facial like um, tweaks or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. You see it. In, Yellowstone, they have their own thing, but it's very specific. In well, well, it's LA. interesting you you pick um, Yellowstone as a comparison because actually one of the things I would say that Yellowstone and Outlander have in common is that um, it uh, it is a, a world where people express themselves economically, you know, so verbally, you know, they're not overly, they're not verbose, they're not mm. making huge speeches. They are they are conveying things uh, minimally in terms of their their dialogue. So a lot of it has to be conveyed, I think, in an unspoken way that you have to actually have in your face. There you go. And uh, right. and I think that's that's very common to those types of people, people who, you know, cowboys, who I've spent some time with. I did a film in Montana last year, and I met a lot of of, of real cowboys, and they are they remind me of Highlanders, Scotsmen in that they're just not that chatty, but they're very sincere and very, very direct. And that's, I think, part of why that happens. Interesting. Yeah. So now we're going to go, the next one we're going to go to, this will be our last one. Okay. It's going to be super high in proof. It's actually made in the mountains of Colorado, in Colorado oh, Springs. Geez. Oh, really? So this is from Colorado? Yes, sir. And yeah. this is a barrel pick that I did from there when I was visiting. Mm. Um, it's a existing brand called 291. Mm. The owner is a 911 survivor. Oh wow. So he's uh, he was on the explosion path of uh, 911. Wow. And he was an art photographer um, and used to photograph a lot of um, models and actors and mm -hmm. they're like you know what I'm done with this shit. I want to make whiskey. <laughs> what a great story. That's wonderful. But it's high octane. Yeah. You can smell that alcohol. It's coming off. Definitely. It's, it's, that's really getting right into your yeah. nasal cavity there. And why, why would somebody um, go for that high alcohol level? And obviously in the so, way that these guys didn't. So consumers today, like we, we tasted a couple like vintage products, uh, three, and um, consumers today want cash strength, oh, so yeah. they can like water it down if they want to. Right. But a lot of people just like sipping on it over. Like someone will sip that for two hours. You know, they're not they're not chugging it, they're not slamming it. Right. They're they're just sipping it for two hours. Right. right. So if you put it on your tongue for just a little bit. It, it can be very warming, very nice, mm. but also it is 128 proof. Oh yeah. You can feel that. Um, it's really, um, that goes, that goes right to the roof of the mouth. It's yeah. It sort of takes a hold of your, your, your tongue and your, your, your throat in a way that Mm. And the it's lips. not soft. No, it's, it's not coming, soft. It's coming at you. It is not soft. You have got that, got that lingering tingle on the lips. Um, yeah, it's a real statement, isn't it? It's it's yeah. it's demanding your attention. Yeah. It's not bad, but it's definitely. It's not no. It's it's in a different for, world of what we've been sipping. For, uh, completely. Um, yeah, it's uh, mm. Mm. 
Oh yeah, really feel that at the front. Your mouth. It's almost like a dragon coming out. A little wheel, yeah. Like, like a dragon. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you're doing House of Dragon, do you, do you actually get to see like the props of the dragons or? You see, yes, to some degree you do. Uh, but most of the time you're reacting to laser lights, and little pointers. It's really, it's, it's at those moments that you do feel vaguely embarrassed because you're having to perform to something that is so not what you're supposed to be performing to. Um, I remember I had to, you know, there was one moment where a dragon was supposed to be flying over my head and uh, I had to, I was told, you know, okay, you have to duck. And I mean, when you're looking at a laser point, I mean, that is really testing your acting ability to duck. When this, and I did this ridiculous sort of duck. And the director said, no, you're supposed to be, this is supposed to be frightening. And I'm like, no, but it's just a little difficult to get frightened by a laser. But I mean, you, you know, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know okay, by well, watching it. I mean, listen, uh, it was the same when we did The Hobbit. We, we weren't even allowed to see the drawings of the dragon until very late in the day. And that was just a pole with a tennis ball on top of it that was being waved around with Peter Jackson roaring like a dragon that was <laughs> that was laughable so we we had to really hold on to our composure to be able to do that but yeah this is um this has got a bit of dragon in it yeah mm. Mm. actually the more you drink it though it changes in your mouth that's what i've noticed the first one the first sip was a bit almost a bit too much mm -hmm. But now, it, it's like my mouth is now prepared for it, and it and it's like okay, okay, we we, we know what's coming now. It's uh, it's you know the acclimation. Yeah, right. So, yeah. But if you drink it too fast or have too much of it, you know that acclimation uh, ends up on the floor. So you got to be very careful when you're uh, yeah when you're doing this for sipping. <sighs> it's an extraordinary experience. This isn't at all what I imagined this oh. experience was going to be like, by the way. Well, I hope, the, you, I hope it oh, was good, though. I hope you oh, enjoyed it. Oh, it's been fantastic. Are you kidding? This is way more than I ever imagined. I mean, I, I feel incredibly privileged to have tried some of these whiskeys. The, really the beautiful thing is, is like you are in this world now. And, and like no matter, Very glad to be in no, it. no matter where, what path McTavish Spirits goes, yeah. like you will always have had a bourbon here. And, 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 and to me, it's like that is you're, you're now part of, of the bourbon history, the lexicon of, of what bourbon is. Yeah. And there yeah. is a there are a lot of celebrities coming into the space. There's a lot mm -hmm. of actors, a lot of musicians, a lot of notable people coming in. But it's those who take it serious. Yeah. That that will that will make it those who just want to use their face. And, yeah. and their name, yeah. they won't make it. And that's never interested me. It's never interested me. I really try and want to park that word that I hate, really, celebrity. I hate that word. It's just, it's. I mean, I know why people say it, but it, I want to sort of put that to one side and really um, be uh, judged and enjoyed or not based on the product rather than anything yeah. else. You know, this is, I, I'm, you know, this is me being somebody who is who is interested in in creating good bourbon. This isn't an actor who's interested in creating a good bourbon. So the actor And I would it. say that like if someone were walking to a store and they saw McTavish bourbon there, that the way that looks, it, it kind of looks like it might have been a, from a Scots Irishman coming over here well, that's, in 1822. That's you know? kind of what I wanted it to look like because okay. it's it it sort of, you know, if you pardon the pun, it distills the journey, my own personal journey as an actor from from Scotland to America, and uh, and I wanted it to be reflected in in the whiskey. So. Well, cheers to you, my friend. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. I'm toasting with some McTavish. Here. Oh, I'm, I'm, oh. I've, I've, you toast with whatever, whatever you want. I'm but. gonna grab this. This looks good. <laughs> cheers. cheers. Thank you, Fred. Whatever it is, it was really good. That was McTavish, I think. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Just a coincidence.
<laughs> All right, so everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Now, I've got Eric back with, with me, and it's worth telling you that he's the owner of the Woodford Hotel, and we actually, you know, he came on as the official uh, hotel of the uh, of the Fred Minnick show. So, you know, tell us about your hotel. Is there like rats in there, dead <laughs> hookers? Like, what do you got going on at the Woodford Hotel? So, uh, the hotel is in a charming historic downtown of Kentucky in Versailles. Um, it's pretty should much- be pronounced Versailles, by the way. No, they actually passed a law naming it Versailles. I know. You have to pass a law in Kentucky to so, like, do pronunciations. That's an <laughs> absolutely waste of governmental resources. Go on. But they just didn't <laughs> want any of there to be any confusion. So, um, But yes, it's an historic downtown. Um, it's also uh, pretty much where um, bourbon was created along Glens Creek, which historically had many, many, many distilleries throughout it. There's still several there. That's... Uh, Woodford Reserve, as you know, yep. uh, E.H. Taylor's original uh, Castle and Key. Um, and then the Old Crow Distillery, which is still there now. Mm. Um, it's mothballed. Um, they haven't done anything with it. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're located just outside of that. And um, the drive there from town to that distillery is amazing. It's just rolling hills of beautiful horse farms, large, uh, you know, just these large tracks of rolling hills. And you get to the creek and then you can see all these beautiful distilleries. And so um, the place is pretty special. And on top of it, James Crow's actually buried uh, two blocks from the hotel. That's right. We plan to dig his bones up and sell them on eBay, right? Uh, yeah. Nobody's figured that out yet. Um, but uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, once your book comes out, people are going to be wearing, or looking all into, you know, his life and story because it's a really great story. Um, the hotel well, has a great story too. It was originally built uh, as a place for people to gather and it was built by the Woodford hotel company. Um, it exchanged uh, hands with two owners um, and the original owner or the second owner, he actually got in a bar fight or a fight with somebody that had spent too much time at the bar next door. Mm. And um, it was one of the original um, cases where it was self-defense. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so there's a lot of history in the town, a lot of history in the place. It's a, Small boutique hotel with eight rooms. Um, we kind of have a uh, commercial space as well as, uh, you know, just a small little town. So we love it. That's right. Um, and I was joking about the rats. There are no rats there. But, you know, I was, Chris is going to kill me. His wife was like, why did you say rats? We have rats. I never said that. I was joking. I didn't mean <laughs> anything by it. But, uh, yeah, so what'd you think of, of Graham? You know, you've gotten, to, we've hung out a lot. and You've been around some celebrities with me. So you can tell that you know sometimes they're cool, sometimes they're not. But what do you think of Graham? Well, he was blown away by the uh, you know the the bourbon and you know very uh, very thoughtful. And I'm sure if he pours that same passion into what he's producing, it's going to be you know something off the charts. So. Yeah, I mean he's learning. I mean he's yeah. definitely he's definitely a celebrity that is uh, you know who is into spirits and he's willing to learn. He's not going to come in and say I know everything. I'm going to do the blending and all that. Uh, but you can tell he's like on, he's like a kid, you know, he's like a grown man as a kid in a candy store doing this bourbon thing. So, yeah, I admire all the different things that he can do acting and I'm sure he's going to create similar, you know, wonderful blockbuster bourbons as well. Blockbuster bourbons. I liked it. And you know, his, uh, bottle and bond is actually really good. I really liked his bottle and bond. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Is there anything that you're tasting these days that you really like? Uh, let's see. Yes. Um, I tasted uh, Still Austin, single barrel uh, the other day. That oh, was yeah. good. Yeah, Still Austin, solid. I know I talk about it a lot, but um, yeah, I picked up single barrel the other day. Okay. And then I was able to find one of those uh, Will It Eight Years in the wild. Oh, the black bottle? The with black the purple? bottle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The that, was, yeah. that was delicious. And then- um, I think when you're over, stop by. I was trying to get you to taste that President Old Forster. I love that. Was that a recent one or an old? It's this old? year's. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Those have nice. those have been like three that stick out to me lately that I was just like, wow. Sounds good. Well, I've got a lot more tasting to do before I finalize my top 100, but it is coming up. I promise. I'm working on it, day in and day out. I am thinking about when can I taste in between my everything else that I'm doing. But uh, man, thanks for coming here. 
Appreciate it. And uh, we're glad we were able to move a few bottles around. People don't realize that I'm actually surrounded by bottles up here on the floor. Uh, Eric can attest to that. So we'll build you some shelves. You know what? I kind of like, <laughs> I have this thought of like, how cool would it be if this thing collapsed while I was in the middle of, of a show? You should definitely set up a recorder so that you can get the actual like collapse. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of afraid like if I do that, then there'll be like a ghost come in or something like <laughs> an alcoholic ghost. It, it, would, it would go viral for sure. Do you believe in alcoholic ghosts? Put it in the comments or shoot me up on fredminnick.com and tell Eric, how, how can they find you on socials? Um, well, Instagram, the Woodford Hotel, uh, as well as the Bourbon Sherpa on Instagram um, and uh, Facebook, uh, the Bourbon Sherpa. And I have a Facebook group called What is on the Bourbon Trail Today? What is on the Bourbon Trail? And we got 20,000 members, and we talk about what's on the bourbon trail. Okay, that's that's cool. So, right. You didn't know about that one, did you? I did know about that, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that one. I thought you didn't know about it. No, I knew about it. I know about everything, bro. Okay. Yeah, so you can find me there, and uh, hope to see you all soon. All right, well, thanks for tuning in, y'all. Be safe out there, and remember, vodka sucks unless it's being used to clean up the murder scene of a dead cat. Cheers. 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 <laughs>